No matter how peaceful or hostile the message has been delivered, the response has been the same. If black people type in the hashtag Black Lives Matter to draw attention to black lives not being given the same treatment and empathy as other lives, instead of talking about ways to ensure that their lives are being treated just like all the other lives that matter, they focus the attention back to black people and how terrible they are for suggesting that some of the lives that matter happen to also be black. If black people protest on the street to draw attention to injustices, instead of discussing those injustices and proposing solutions, they focus the attention back to black people and how much of a terrible thug they are to be protesting, rioting, and inconveniencing traffic. If during the national anthem black people take a knee or raise a fist as a gesture of solidarity and to inspire the country to live up to its ideals to stand against injustice and inequality. Instead of addressing those injustices and inequalities, they focus the attention back to black people and how terrible they are to disrespect the national anthem and inconvenience their football game. If black people dare to tell stories of how they've been unfairly treated by citizens or police, instead of taking their stories and testimonies seriously, they focus the attention back to black people and how terrible they are that they must have done something to deserve it. While the similarities in these responses might be conscious or subconscious, it is not a coincidence and their response is loud and clear. And there are three takeaways that we get from that response. Number one, they do not want to discuss nor care to discuss the concerns of black people. Injustice can happen to just about any subpopulation, and they're encouraged to speak out about it. But when it comes to black people, <laughs> this is an empathy issue. Blacks have always known it, and they've seen the subtle signs of it all along. It's the reason why the Black Lives Matter hashtag gained popularity in the first place. Hey guys, I was just wondering, you know... When I could get the same treatment as everybody else, you know, black lives matter too, you know, hey, you know, Martin Luther King, whoa, whoa, <laughs> just saw him, oh, what, what, you, black, we don't matter, okay, all lives matter instead, okay. Number two, the complaints about injustices are not a larger issue than the inconveniences they face from hearing about it. This highlights a tension between two needs. The needs for blacks to speak out about the injustices they face and have their experiences acknowledged, and the need of others to not have to be inconvenienced by having to hear about these injustices. Whether it's on their Facebook timeline, on their drive to work, during the football game, etc. And in when, whether or not we want to actually discuss and deal with these issues, or try not to be inconvenienced by it, they've shown that their empathy is towards those who have to be inconvenienced by hearing about it. As I've said before, if you say that hummingbirds fly, they don't feel compelled to say all birds fly. But if you say black lives matter, they are compelled to say all lives matter. It's the mentioning of race that they'd rather not be inconvenienced by hearing about. Hence, they subconsciously use extreme avoidance tactics to make sure that they never have to address the issue that is underlying the message. Number three, in each of their responses, it always came back to black people and how they are responsible and deserving of their own sufferings. In each instance, the focus is turned back to black people as if that's somehow supposed to justify the way they're treated. He had to do something to deserve. Ain't no cop just gonna start beating on you and whooping you up for no reason. You uh, you did something now. Well, if you would just pull up your pants and stop acting like a thug, then maybe you might not get pulled over all this time. I think I understand it. Black people, you're raised by parents who teach you to hate the police and you, you got a chip on your shoulder and the police are just responding to that chip that you're putting out there. You need to just let go of that hospitality. Slavery ended like 150 years ago. A lot of the time they'll have zero evidence that this actually is the case. But for some reason it's a whole lot easier to assume that the black person did something wrong than it is to assume that the police officer did. Let's stay with that thought for a moment and ask yourself why that is. Victim blaming is nothing new. You often hear about it in the context of rape victims being blamed for causing their own rape somehow. When it comes to black victims, if you can find an unbecoming Facebook post or evidence that they smoke weed at one point in their life, then that somehow makes people feel better that that black person became a victim. Oh, oh wait, 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 what's this? Trayvon Martin smoked weed before? He deserved to die! Free my homie Zimmerman. One common victim blame response is to blame it on, um, uh, black on black crime. I guess somehow because black on black crime exists that we're individually responsible whether we did the black on black crime or not and we deserve whatever treatment we get from the police. That's something like that, I guess, is their argument.
But whatever happened to Martin Luther King's dream of treating people by the content of their character and not the color of their skin? That famous line has two parts to it. Treating people by the content of their character? Don't treat people based off the color of their skin. A lot of people only heard the second part because they're frantically trying to rewrite every racial disparity about black people in terms of some other factor. Such as poverty or living in a high crime neighborhood. Hey man, it's okay. It's because you're poor, man. It's not because you're black. That means we don't need to reform the police system. Hey man, it's not because you're black. It's because you live in a high crime neighborhood. And you live in that neighborhood because you're too poor to move out. So it's really because you're poor. Rest assured, this is not racism. It's just a poor tax. You're going to have to be pulled over, have your car searched, be stopped and frisked. And don't even worry about it. We don't need to change anything about the system because this helps me feel safer about you. But I guess they didn't hear the first part about what Martin Luther King said about treating folks based on the content of their character. I guess the thinking is, as long as you rephrase it away from race, everything else is fair game. And look, don't appoint me to be responsible for black on black crime unless you're accusing me of criminal behavior and have evidence against me. I don't hold you responsible for every crime a white person does just so you can have a chance to talk about the injustices that happen to you. But back to my point about black people deserving their own victimhood or subclass status. This has always been the excuse to allow racial injustice to happen since before this country began. The kindergarten explanation that we learned for why Jim Crow and slavery happened so long ago is that white people were just walking around with burning rage and hate inside their hearts for black people just because of their skin color. Why? I don't know. They just did. So terrible things ended up happening. And those kindergarten explanations lead to kindergarten solutions, such as... The key is to stop seeing color, my brother. If I can't see your color, then I can't enslave you. <laughs> if you never get an upgraded explanation for the problem, then you'll never get an upgraded solution. And that's why I'm forced to make this video. Let me upgrade you. Yeah, I agree. That was pathetic. The key to understanding this country's past is to understand cognitive dissonance. And by doing a quick Google, I find that the definition of cognitive dissonance is the state of having inconsistent thoughts, beliefs, or attitudes, especially as relating to behavioral decisions and attitude change. Think of it like this. If you're conflicted in the mind, then you experience mental distress because of that. The physical signs in your body from that distress are often what lie detector tests are trying to read. Most people can't do something that they know is morally wrong without having to eat them up inside. And that's why so many people feel compelled to justify everything that they do. Sometimes it's not even about trying to deceive you. They're trying to convince themselves of the lies so that they can live with themselves. I'll use this example. Think about the last time you ate meat. A.K.A. animals. Did you lose any sleep over eating that animal? Probably not. Why is that? We have to believe that animals are either deserving and meant to be eaten or are a subspecies compared to humans in order to justify eating them and sleep well at night. The only other way around this is to intentionally try not to think about it. That's why you can walk through the meat section of a grocery store without seeing too many things that resemble the look of an animal that once lived. Companies know that they must not remind you that you're buying something that used to be alive. In order to ensure that you remove the cognitive dissonance necessary for you to buy more meat and eat it. Many Americans go to other countries and are shocked when they end up eating food that still have the head intact and hasn't had all this extra preparation done to it in order to make sure that they don't remind us that it used to be alive. So the people that won't allow themselves to think of animals as being deserving for food or a subspecies of human beings, what do you think happens to them? Exactly, they become vegetarians and vegans. Otherwise, they'd be tormented and distressed every time they ate a steak at night. And let me show you how powerfully and subconsciously we deal with our cognitive dissonance. And many of us who are not vegans, who eat meat, and don't believe that animals deserve the same rights as human beings, we've created special subclasses of animals that we're close in proximity to. Let's call them pets. And they are exalted to a higher class than the rest of the animals in the animal kingdom. We've even encoded it in our laws to make sure that stores aren't selling dog, cat, and horse meat out the meat section. Our cognitive dissonance wouldn't allow us to bond with our pets the way that we do. And in many cases, with bonds that are just as close as our relationships with other human beings. And then turn around and eat them for dinner. And we feel so strongly about it that we've passed laws to make sure that nobody else is able to eat their pets too. 
We judge people harshly for eating these type of animals, so much so that we pass laws to make sure nobody can do it. So in order for me to enjoy my bacon and my pets too, without having to face the music of cognitive dissonance, we had to create classes and subclasses of animals without even noticing it. This all happens subconsciously. And if we can make subclasses of animals without even realizing it, we can make subclasses of human beings too. During slavery and Jim Crow, blacks had to be looked at as a subclass. Morally deprived, lazy, freeloaders just looking for a handout, fit for and deserving of their condition in order for people to live with themselves and their actions. How else could so many philosophers, founders, past presidents of this country, etc., have spoken so wisely about the principles of justice, equality, liberty, and democracy while themselves owning slaves and supporting the institution? There had to be a justification for why these principles didn't apply to black people. The answer is cognitive dissonance. Many of these famous figures are well documented in their attempts to justify blacks as a subclass. But their remarks are often whitewashed from our history books in order so that we don't have to be conflicted by the cognitive dissonance. That means we can enjoy the warm, fuzzy feelings that we feel when we think about our founders and our past presidents, the flag, and all the great things about this nation, even the national anthem, without having to think about all the negative, pesky details that were there along at the same time. And so I can soothe my cognitive dissonance. I'll get mad at you for even bringing it up. And just like pets can have laws that cement their subclass status, the same can be done with race. Remember, black people were counted as three-fifths of a white person. And even though some poor whites worked in the fields right alongside black slaves, they always enjoyed an elevated subclass above slaves. White elites created the term white trash to talk about poor white people, but even that poor white people could say, at least I'm not black. And a lot of that dynamic was created to make sure that the poor whites don't join with the black people to try to overthrow the elites. President Lyndon B. Johnson, yeah, the same one that passed the Civil Rights Act in 1964, once said, quote, I'll tell you what's at the bottom of it. If you can convince the lowest white man that he's better than the best colored man, he won't notice you're picking his pocket. Hell, give him somebody to look down on and he'll empty his pockets for you, unquote. In the past, people had no moral problems considering blacks to be subhumans to whites. Today, that's a moral dilemma that we have to reconcile. We have to do extra backflips to ease our cognitive dissonance that we didn't have to do in the past. So blatantly obvious forms of racism, we can all agree that those are racism. But the subtle ones that hit all the right undertones but don't explicitly mention race are warmly received because they ease my cognitive dissonance. And I'll adamantly fight to make sure that you race baiters don't bring back up my dissonance. Partner. So that dissonance pops up every time we try to deal with race, but we end up deflecting the conversation somewhere else to deal with something else instead. It's there when we believe that something negative about the black person had to justify the officer's actions in every case. It's what drives people to victim blame black people for their own condition. Of course, I never walked in your shoes or nothing or know anything about you. But one thing I do know that it's your own fault and you need to take responsibility for your own actions. Stop looking for a handout and blaming the white man. The mass denial of black people's experiences in order to ease the cognitive dissonance is real. It would be like denying that women ever get dick pics in their inbox just because I never got one in mine. What's that? A screenshot? Come on now, you must have said something to him to get him to send you that pic. Ain't nobody just going to send you no pic out of nowhere. Show me the messages you deleted in between there asking for the pic. Mm -hmm -hmm. Cognitive dissonance is what makes it easier to believe that 90 plus percent of black people are drones and zombies to the mass media and Democrats. And are incapable of independent objective thoughts. Those subhumans. Then it is to deal with the, unco the uncomfortable belief that maybe, just maybe, something racially inappropriate might be going on. Wow. Imagine that cognitive dissonance being responsible for people writing off the opinions and the lived experiences of black people. Just because the thought of it being true would have unpleasant implications. Many of the people watching this right now will see the truth in much of what I'm talking about and feel very uncomfortable because of it. Subconsciously, their mind is finding a way right now to deal with that cognitive dissonance that's rising up. Yeah, yeah, I hear what you're saying, but but it don't apply to me because uh, black on black crime and uh, uh, Barack Obama, yeah, Barack Obama, uh, 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 just stop, just stop. Maybe they ranted and trolled so hard on the black person on social media that they've crossed the point of no return. 
where the cognitive dissonance would be too great for them to have to face up to if they found out that they were wrong all along. I mean, if you see a video of a Black Lives Matter protester being intentionally mowed down in the street by a car and all you can say is, he shouldn't have been in the street, then there's a pretty good chance that your cognitive dissonance has led you to subconsciously not think very highly about the lives of black people. And you're exactly the person that the Black Lives Matter slogan is intended to reach. If people have to go out of their way to tell you that a person was an honor roll student with a clean criminal record in order for you to value their lives and not lump them in with the rest of the lives that you don't value, then there's a good chance that you undervalue lives subconsciously and you don't even know about it. You're free to continue soothing your cognitive dissonance if you want to, but be aware that with each soothing of that discomfort, you help to ensure that the problem persists. You have to make a choice. We all do. Nobody's moving from cognitive dissonance having an impact on their lives. Will we ease the discomfort to satisfy the cognitive dissonance so that injustice can go on living for yet one more day? Or will you make a sacrifice on principle and face up to that cognitive dissonance? Will your cognitive dissonance continue to make you focus on how imperfect the messenger is instead of dealing with the message? Will that cognitive dissonance allow you to rephrase everything away from race? We're not black and white! We're Americans! As if country divisions are holier and haven't led to us ignoring the plight of people who don't ha carry the title of being of American. It's not because you're black, it's because you're poor. White people go through the same thing. Just because income plays a role in disparities doesn't mean that race and other factors can't play a role as well. But is it any better to have people treated under suspicion by police just because they li are too poor to live in a different neighborhood? Philandro Castillo was pulled over more than 50 times. You really think he was that bad of a driver? There are people in New York City that have been stopped and frisked over a hundred times without a single charge being filed against them. And 90% of the time when they're stopped and frisked, they're sent home without a charge because they weren't guilty of anything. And before we're too quick to dismiss race as a factor in anything that deals with policing, consider this. A Sanford study in Oakland found that 2,890 African American had been handcuffed but not arrested in a 13 month period. During that same period, only 193 white people were handcuffed but not arrested. I want you to understand how big of a difference that is in numbers. We're talking about 200 white people versus 3,000 black people. These were innocent people who weren't arrested at the end. That big of a difference can't be explained away by things like population, demographics, or that you're poor and all that stuff. It just doesn't do that. Statistically, just you can't justify that. Now you tell me, what beliefs does a police officer have to have in their head in order for them to subconsciously do this to black people? Where they're a threat that has to be controlled for and put in handcuffs so that they can complete their investigation. But I don't feel quite the same way about white people. At least not nearly on as large of a scale. At some point we have to face the cognitive dissonance and face the truth. If black youth are being subconsciously treated like criminals throughout their upbringing, what effect do you think that would have on the kid? And before you say, we all face a little adversity in our lives, just, you know, keep on working hard, pick yourself up by your own bootstraps, and you can make it, you can be anything and everything that you want to be in life. Race doesn't matter. Realize that that wasn't an answer to my question, and it only served your cognitive dissonance that rose up. And secondly, if you really totally believe that that's actually true, I'm going to challenge you to this. Raise your children up, treating them like they're tri criminals and guilty and good for nothing and having lack of empathy towards them. And, you know, just do that for the rest of their lives. Wait, to, at least at least to the 18. Let's just see how it works. Play it out that long. Can't be that bad. It won't turn out. You know, they'll pick themselves by the bootstraps, right? They'll, they'll be all right. They won't turn up into any criminals or anything because of that, will they? Ah, yeah, you, you won't do it. Ah, figures. It's one thing to say that everybody should work hard and never give up no matter how tough the road gets. Because hard work and effort will always lead to better outcomes than giving up or not working hard. But to go a step further and pretend as if all outcomes are blind to race and only to take merit into consideration is a magical work of cognitive dissonance. For homework, I want you to read this summary of the information given in the Demar Department of Justice DOJ uh, Baltimore report. As you read about how the attitudes and us versus them culture that existed within the police department went on, I want you to think about how that fits into the concepts of uh, cognitive dissonance and how that works out. And instead of thinking of these people as bad apples, think of them people as people that think that they're good, community leaders, people that go to church, work hard, their families, everybody that knows them, loves them, don't think they would even hurt a fly. 
Keep in mind that people like this are also working in New York City where stop and frisk is the law of land and 9 out of 10 people are completely innocent that they're stopping. Think about what mindset has to exist to allow you to be able to shake down people who are perfectly innocent. And they're clearly not happy that you're doing it and they don't believe that you're serving and protecting their interest as opposed to some other interest. You can't stay in that type of position without having some other beliefs that alongside it that justify and make it okay for you to do it. To justify the 9 out of 10 based on the 1 out of 10 that ends up being a criminal and the lower crime rate based upon these policies, it's like throwing the baby out with the bathwater. You have no concern about what impact you're having on the community. It's like the guy that justifies sending out 10 dick pics by clinging on to the one person that says ooh la la and ignoring the other 9 people who said ill gross. Hooray for stop and frisk. Hooray for broken windows law enforcement policies. Hooray dick pics. No matter how peaceful or hostile the message has been delivered, the response has been the same. What's your response? Comment on this video, share it with your friends, get their reaction. Follow me on YouTube or Facebook at The Truth Race. Stay tuned for part three of this series. I'm Chris Russie, and until next time.